Hi, so I'm Evan Park. I'm a national master. And I played in the 2019 World Cadets and I placed fifth. So yeah, that's pretty much all there really is to say. So let's get started. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, there we go. Also, it's that. All right. So, let's get started. So, this was my game against an IM. His name was Yona Josa Felix Jose. I do not know how to pronounce his last name properly. But okay, so let's just get into the game. So I'm going to. F so he plays c4. And here, I wouldn't. I normally play e6 here. So after knight c3, d5, d4, we would transpose to a queen's gambit. But I actually hadn't played this in a while, so I was a little bit rusty in like the minority attack, especially. So nowadays I would just avoid all of this and play bishop b4, but then I play knight f6. And in this position, he can take on d5. And so if I were to play like this, he does have this additional option after this move queen to c2, which prevents my bishop from developing to f5. He can play, for example, if I play bishop b7, e3, c6, wait, sorry, um, bishop g5 first. I apologize. Um, so basically, now he has bishop takes f6 ideas. So after bishop e7, now, now you can play queen c2, c6, e3. And in this position, white has, in addition to his normal rook b1, b4, b5 idea, which I will discuss later, he also has this interesting idea to play e3. And the point here is that after castles, bishop d3, knight d7, knight e2, he's not going to be playing the normal b4. He's going to castle short, play f3, 4, and from there he can, from there it will get kind of unpleasant because e5 will become a threat. So let's say black plays rook e8, castle short, Knight f8. So this will be normal generally, and this is a this is a logical plan to try and kick out the bishop from g5. But here white has f3, and after knight to e6, which is well inaccurate because bishop takes f6. But let's say black does play something like bishop e6, and the thing is here now white will play bishop h4. And eventually he'll play bishop f2 and e4 will become kind of hard to stop. And because of this, I don't really like to play this because once white does achieve e4, he can play e5, then f4, then f5. And it's highly plausible that black will get mated. So I prefer to avoid these positions. So with my move, bishop e7 here, the main point is uh, if he does take take. He doesn't have that many useful waiting moves. He can't play bishop g5 because it hangs a bishop. And if he plays e3, he's blocking in his own bishop, which generally is what you want to avoid that. So most of the time white will play bishop f5, f4. And after knight f6 here, e3, c6, there's no more f3 idea because after, let's say, bishop d3, castles, and knight e2, 
the bishop would very much rather be on g5 because on on h4 like it's here if white does decide to play hf3 at some point black might even have some knight h5 idea just to t take this bishop while on g5 the bishop of course could just trade so that being said so my opponent transposes with knight f3 and now we are back in the main line and in this position white should well black transposes with knight f6 here and so so that is pretty much the queen's gambit theory i guess but in this game i knew for a fact my opponent didn't take on d5 so i decided to play knight f6 immediately because after let's say bishop f4 he does some have some ideas with even h3 and g4 which is additional something you have to worry about but it's not very like threatening necessarily but it is an additional possibility and i looked at my opponent's games when i saw he's not playing e takes c takes d5 and e e3 stuff and he plays the minority attack so we got into this position castles bishop d3 knight d7 but he plays h3 and this move h3 kind of surprised me like i would normally not be surprised but i i didn't have i hadn't played this in a while here and well one of the ideas is the bishop might go to f4 to and black white will try and oops white will try and save the bishop with bishop h2 and so here now white well now white will just continue to play normally and i was just wondering what could white be threatening with this type of move like h3 but in reality it's just it, there's nothing really different about it compared to other lines and so simply rook e8 should be played knight f3 knight f8 castles and g6 so with this move g6 i am going to prepare knight e6 because if i play knight e6 immediately there's bishop takes f6 Okay, okay, so I just turned off the notation. Um, I turned it on earlier because this wasn't the exact move order and there's a lot of move orders to get into the Queen's Gambit, so I need to see which way the game goes. But okay, now that we're in regular territory. So okay, white castles, black plays g6, with the point that, well, knight e6 is now going to be a serious idea. And so now white starts the minority attack. So it, the reason it's called the minority attack is because, well, the reason it's called the minority attack is because white has a, actually a pawn minority on the queen side. As you can see, black has four pawns and white has three. And so, wait, why did I highlight the knight? Okay. So white has three pawns. And so basically white has a pawn minority on the side, which is where the plan gets its name. So what white's going to do is he's going to play b4. And with b4, he plans to play b5. And then once there, the pawn, well, it gives black a choice that he doesn't really want to make. Well, he can either let white take on c6, which will give him a backward pawn on c6 that can be targeted, or he can just take on b5 but if he does do that this isolates the d5 pawn and removes the flexibility from black's pawn chain um so generally he will let white take on c6 once the pawn gets there 
But then white will play maybe like knight a4, knight c5, and he'll have pressure on the c6 pawn. So this is the whole point of the plan. And so in this position, I play knight e6. So I felt like this was very logical because the bishop needs, I thought it needs to move um, because uh, I don't, don't think he would want me to take here. So he pretty much has two options. He can take here and give me a uncontested dark square control or he can move it away. But while this is theory, he plays b4, which is not a bad move actually. So initially I was sort of surprised by this move, but eventually I realized that in reality, it's just like any other move. There's no real difference because if I do take on g5, take on g5, while this knight might look a little bit misplaced on g5, the thing is I can't really attack it in any way. I did play knight h5. So let me just, yeah. Okay. So, so, sorry, let me continue. So if I do play knight h5, well, the knight just goes back to f3, and while this knight on h5 can go to g7, and it's not necessarily a bad plan to trade off light square bishops, it's interesting that this move is just not weaker than any other move in particular, and that b4 is just an absolutely fine move. So instead of knight takes g5, I played a6. So the point of this move is, well, to temporarily stop b5. But this isn't going to last forever since white's just going to play a4. But the actual point of this move is that once white does play b5, black will take, take, and, and once black takes on b5 and white takes on c6, black will no longer have this a pawn on a7. And this is sort of double-edged because on one hand, this a pawn could become weak if it were on a7. Let's say I take, take, knight h5, knight g7, b5, and like, let's say, bishop to f5, takes, takes. On one hand, this a pawn could become weak. But on the other hand, well, it does control this b6 square and possibly White's rook can come to b6 in some lines and attack c6. But I generally think that it's worth just getting rid of this isolated pawn on c7. I mean a7. Um, it's just one less weakness to take care of on the queens. So I, do pl I did play a6 in the game. And after a4, knight takes g5, takes knight h5. So I did play this plan. And after b5, so he carries out his plan of the of weakening my queen side pawns. Takes, takes. And now I made an error here. I played this move knight e6. And my logic here was I wanted to prepare c5. And then I thought my knight could take on c5. And then I'm very solid. I have two bishops. I have some queens I play. My pieces are pretty active. And that seems all great. But it doesn't really work, and my opponent played nicely, and he found a refutation to my move. Instead of here, pretty much any other move that wasn't a knight move is fine. Like, bishop f5 is fine. Pretty sure bishop even d7 is, like, okay, but knight e6 is an error. Can you try and see what my opponent did here?
Okay, so 95 is certainly logical, yes, but um, yeah, B takes C6 first is better. Um, so after B takes C6, now while well, white black no longer has even A takes B5 possibility, normally he wouldn't want to play that anyway, but here my position is already very bad. And now, yes, now white plays knight to E5. And now I have an issue because, well, it's difficult to see how to defend this pawn. For example, if I play C5, maybe my opponent can play maybe even bishop b5, and I have to move my rook away, and then bishop c6, and that's a fork. So, yeah, so it's not so easy to see what I can do here. So I play, I play queen c7, and I thought this move would keep everything together, and then I can chase the knight away, but my opponent played a good move here, so once again, try and see what, what you would do here. Um, if knight b5, um, if I take it, is that a free knight? That, I don't know. That, that seems like a free knight to me. But yes, I, I think, yes, if this knight was not on e6, then that would definitely work. Okay, so all right, let's look at rook f c one. So yes, this is very logical, but and it's well, if white didn't have anything here, then I feel like you would certainly play like this. Um, not like knight takes d five is possible. Knight b five is in the air. So yes, if white didn't have something more direct, he would definitely play like this. I would probably play rook a seven, but it's not really clear. I mean, my position is still pretty unpleasant. About the move h4, so if I take it? That also seems like a free pawn. But yes, rook c1 is a very logical move, but white has a very direct way to play. Okay, so, okay, so two moves have been recommended again. So rook a1 makes somewhat sense, but I feel like compared to rook c1, the, it's less logical because rook a1 well, I don't know. Like, is this rook really worse? Like, worse than this rook that it's worth a tempo to trade off? I don't think so. Um, yes, knight a4 is also somewhat logical. And so the main point is to stop c5. But once again, white has. White has just. Uh, white has a. Um, white has a better way to play than all of this. He can, he can forcefully win my c6 pawn. Uh, if e4, the knight takes d4s, 
But, uh, yeah, right? And I'm also going to take e5. That doesn't look very good. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, knight takes e6. Yes, that's right. So one thing you have to do check is if this pawn is really defended, and it's not. Because if I do take on c6, there's bishop b5, and suddenly my queen and rook are in a skewer, and I cannot move my queen anywhere that it will defend this rook, so I'm just going to lose my rook, I guess. So pretty much he just snatches a pawn here, and I have no compensation. And at this point, I'm pretty much completely lost. There's not much I can do. Even his pawn structure and pieces are better than me. But I mean, I haven't lost yet, so I can keep playing. So I play bishop b7. So now if knight takes d5, I can take on c6. So he just takes on e7. Rook takes and queen b3. And here, he's pressuring my d5 pawn, so I put queen d6, rook f to c1. And you can see, I really don't have any hope for any counterplay. I was at this point even looking at like some knight g5 ideas to maybe somehow sack a knight, but there's no play really, um, because I have no attackers on the king side. So I'm pretty much just down a pawn, and what's more, he ha is controlling both important files on the queen side. So my first goal was just not to lose my d5 pawn. I felt if I could do that, then at least I wouldn't lose immediately. So I bet knight g5. So I'm just going to try to, um, I'm just going to try and scare him somewhat with like rook takes e3 and then knight takes h3 ideas. Maybe make him do something that he normally wouldn't want to do, but it's just fantasy. For example, even if he did play something weird, like, I don't even know. Like, it's just like every single move literally defends against this. Like, let's say, um, like, even rook b2, I can't really sack now because the rook comes and defends on g2. Let's say, takes, takes, and rook g2. And he's up a rook. I don't know. So it was really just kind of false hope, but he plays knight b5. And so my queen doesn't have many good squares. I mean, it could go to d8. But here, um, I don't know exactly what I was worried about. But I went to b8. I don't know if this is worse or if this is better, but it's just another move. And here he plays knight c7. So does anybody have an opinion on this move? And by the way, I'm not saying this move is bad or good. It's just, what are your thoughts on it? So does anybody have any thoughts on this move here? All right, let me just confirm this. This move does not blunder the knight. Rook takes c7. This was his point. 
Um, so yeah, Black White does not lose the night. Um, he wanted to force more trades. Okay, so yeah, it, it it is okay. Um, yeah, it, it's a fine move. It it's not like good or bad, but the question is, is if these trades favor white or not. It's not that easy to say. Of course, yes, they should favor white because he's a material. But at the same time, you have to see that white's pieces here are significantly more active than blacks. I mean, I have a queen on b8, a rook on e7, and my bishop is like more target than anything. So, so to be honest, I'm not sure if this is was the right way to go. Maybe he could have just played like mm, something like even like rook c2. I don't know what I'm going to play because. I don't have many moves here because my most of my pieces are just going to be stuck defending forever. So, but it's okay. He plays knight c seven. Rook takes c seven. Takes 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 takes. Okay, now I'm going to address the comment. They favor white because black has an isolated pawn. Yes, I guess that could be true, but. More importantly, what's up material, so that would help white more than the isolated pawn, which is very weak, of course, but, well, white's up a pawn. Like, if white wasn't up a pawn, like, if this D pawn was removed from the board, I think black would draw pretty easily, so. Okay, so at this point, I realized that this D pawn is so weak that white's going to play rook to b5 and then maybe maneuver his bishop over to like b3 and then I won't be able to defend it. So at this point I'm kind of desperate because there's not much I can do. So I play rook to a1 check. My reasoning behind this move was if he does decide to play king h2 at least the f pawn's now unprotected. I'm not sure how much this would help white, I mean black, but maybe in some lines I have knight e4. It would, it's not probably that serious, but that was my thinking. And so he plays rook b1. He just wants to avoid any counterplay at all. And so the rook trade here would pretty much give me a hopeless ending because after bishop takes b1, what's really more important than my, um, that I'm down upon is that my d pawn is really weak. So I will have to go knight e6, bishop c2, and knight c7. From this point, let's say white plays f3 and king f2. I, I don't know how I'm going to stop white from just either playing e4 at some good point or maybe even bringing his king to c5 or somewhere on the queen side. So I thought my only chance was to keep rooks. Rook a3. And after h4, so this was a nice move. Um, Thing is, if his bishop didn't move, I suppose my knight can go to, let's say, e4, and I can try and hope for something. But after h4, he kind of just kills everything, because if I do go knight e4, which was played, bishop takes this ending. So does anybody have any thoughts on this ending? Like, did white's position improve? Did it, like... 
did this hurt his position? How easy do you think this is to win? Yes, he does now have a pass pawn. That's a nice feature to note. And yeah, so definitely, I don't think White's position has like decreased his advantage or anything. This should be very easy to win. Um, because the mo most important thing is this pawn is still overextended and it's weak. And I can't really defend it without making some concessions. And then he can just bring his king in and win the game. So that's pretty much how things went for a while. Rook b8 check, rook e8. He provokes my f5. Hard to win for who? I'm not sure I really understand this comment. I think it will be hard to win because he has a pass pawn and you can't trade rooks. Because, like, that seems to be putting two contradicting things together, like trading rooks, the fact that you can't trade rooks, and that you have a pass pawn. But I guess I'll assume that you mean that white's going to have a hard time winning. Okay. But in reality, the win should be not so difficult. Um. For example, after f5, which is forced to defend e4, rook e7 check. So here, I have a problem. Because if my king goes to h6, it's going to be stuck there forever. Like, absolutely forever. Because I can't go to h5 without hanging h7. And if I do push g5, I also hang h7. So pretty much, I'm going to be stuck there forever. So I felt that keeping my king in a more flexible place was worth even going to the seventh rank. But here, why should not have too many difficulties winning? So he plays g4. So what do you think about this move? too early. Okay, any other thoughts? G4, G5? I assume you mean white's going to play G4, G5? Um... Yeah, I mean, I think white, if I don't do anything, he's going to take on f5. And after, let's say I, I play like rook a2, he takes, takes. Well, first of all, I'm already losing another pawn here. But even if I wasn't, he can now bring his king up, king g2, king g3. And at some point, he will play king f4. And I will lose my f pawn, and I will lose the game. So... Yeah, this is not a bad move, but I kind of hope for this because if white plays normally like king h2, I don't have really any hope of doing anything. Say rook a2, king g3. The only hope I really have is that he can't somehow get his king in, but that doesn't seem very realistic. I mean, I'm literally trapped on the back rank myself, and I feel like with some f3, at some point, white will win pretty easily. So after g4, I was kind of hoping that maybe I can get some counterplay after f takes g4. So now I have at least some idea that I can maybe play h5 and then g5, and then I have a pass pawn. So let's see how that works in the game. So can g2. Okay, it's a normal move because this e pawn is not going anywhere. Um, so he might as well improve his king first. H5, rook takes E4. 
so yes, this is completely losing for Black. Um, there's not too much hope, but at least I knew kind of what to do. I had to get a position where I have a past H pawn, and his pawns aren't very advanced. And then I can push my H pawn, and then depending on what happens, I might either A, get into a position where I can take one of his pawns, or B, get counterplay against his own king, because my past pawn is very far advanced. So, so, so I play king f7, and he plays rook e5. So I understand what he's doing here. He's going to play d5, e4, and he's going to push another rank with his pawn. So I play king f6, f3 takes, and check, and okay. So starting from this position, the thing I really need is a pass pawn, but because he plays his rook well on e5, I really can't make a pass pawn right now. So sadly, I'm going to have to wait until he plays d5 at some point, and then rook e6, and then, only then, I can make a pass pawn. So technically, I should be too slow, but it doesn't really happen in the game. After rook h2, king g3. Yeah, so I'm not sure why I didn't play king g3. Um, as far as I can see, it's much more logical because, well, the rook defends pretty much everything on e5. Pass pawns wise. Maybe he was worried that like rook e2 or rook d2 will make it hard to make progress, but I don't think so because like even something like mm, like rook e8 and and then and then he can check my king and then he can bring his rook back. I don't know. It seems like he can make solid progress. But okay, so he plays rookie four, and I jump at the chance to make a pass pawn early. So yeah, now white's still winning, but because he didn't play very accurately, it's not really easy to win already. Um, after h takes g5 takes, king to g3, rook d2, I have some clear counterplay. If he does start to advance his pawns, like rook e5, d5, e4, the thing is, then my rook will get another rank, and then his king will be forced back. And so it's questionable how he's going to make progress. And in the game, I already had, I thought I had decent drawing chances here. Not very good, but still decent. So after king g6, d5, rook d1, I'm waiting for him to play e4, because he's going to have to play it eventually, otherwise he will be able to push his pawns. So e4. Rook G1. Okay. So here I my thinking behind this move was to be annoying because where does the king go now? Um, if it goes to h4, I repeat. If it goes to f4, that's questionable because now it's cut off and I can start pushing my pawn. Um, so it goes to f2, but this is what I was hoping for. If it went to h2, it would be kind of difficult to see what I can do here because Let's say even if I play rook g4, he just keeps pushing, and my counterplay is kind of slow here. Um, as opposed to f2, I can immediately start pushing the pawn. And so, yeah. So, let me, sorry. Uh, so yeah, rook d1, king e2. He's running even further away, which kind of surprised me, because... I thought you were. Go I thought he was going to get worried about h4 at some point. Okay, and this move rook d4. I thought at least temporarily this was the best place for the rook because it attacks both pawns and slows White's advance a little bit. So if White goes king e3, I go back to d1, and so it's not really clear what he achieved from that. So he plays king f3, and. 
I think at this point, I didn't really know what his plan was, so I just went back to T1. Because if White does try to make progress, he is going to give me counterplay. So after Rook E8. So by this point, he, I think he was going to start pushing the pawns. And so he repeats once and then plays D6. But actually, I'm pretty sure this was an error. White had to actually keep the king cut off. Um, not with rook f5. But I'm pretty sure he had to play king e3, king d4. Um, and I think the point is, well, his pawns are actually faster than mine. Because if I play like h4, rook e8, now his king is supporting the pawns. And so let's say I play king maybe to g5, rook h8, king g4, e5, king e5, h3, d6. I think it's, he's clearly faster than me, and he should get a winning position. So that was the right plan. But he tried to push his pawn solely with his rook, and in the process, his king got under attack. So by now it's already drawn. And now because of the mate threats, you can't make progress. So I run back to the pawn, take one, and then the game was a green draw on here. So pretty much what happened in this game was white won a pawn using a nice tactic, but he made some questionable decisions and gave me too much counterplay. And so what happened then was I was able to get play with my own pass pawn that I created, and then I was able to draw. So two things made my draw easier. Number one, it was a rook ending, which helps a lot because rooks are very good at, well, at counterplay because you can attack the king and cut them off and all that good stuff. And they're also good at stopping your opponent's pawns from a distance. So they can do two things at once. They can both create counterplay by attacking your opponent's king. They can also stop your opponent's pawns. So eventually I was able to draw after he made some more errors. All right, so that concludes example one. And so our topic will be how to play difficult positions. So I'm going to pause my share temporarily and I'm going to load the next example. Okay, so I'm going to turn this off. And so the first thing you might think of when, um, when you see difficult position is swindling. And so pretty much what swindling is, is um, a concept where well, when you're lost, you create some tricks for your opponent and you manage to even win, possibly. And so this example is a game from Carlson. And so this, I have to say, swindling is a very extreme side of the spectrum in terms of difficult positions. Because difficult positions has many, many like definitions. Like you could be worse, you could just be downright losing. Or you can be even better, but you're under attack or something like that. So, so swindling is like when you're just completely lost. And so after King G7 in this position, Black is, I mean, Black, Black is completely winning. As you can see, he's up in exchange and in addition, his pawn is about to queen. But 
Carlson plays kind of nice. He plays queen g7 trap. And the point about this move is that while it may not be best, pretty much everything loses, so you're going to give your opponent a choice to make maybe even a slight mistake. So in this position, black had a very simple win with king h8 when white is kind of out of checks, and then black will take the knight, and then he will queen, and then he will win. But probably black was in time pressure, and he played seemingly a more natural move, rook f7, which also wins. Um, but after queen d8, he already had to take into account some queen g5 stuff. So, with that in mind, what would you play here as black? Okay, so yeah, 97 is the suggestion, and it wins, actually. It definitely wins. Um, and But to be honest, he could have just taken on c3. Um, and the point is, after king, queen g5 check, queen h5, well, white's going to run out of checks. And after queen g6, King to f8, black runs away, there's no more checks, and let's go again. So if black had really just calculated a bit, he could have taken on c3. 97 also works, just stopping everything, and that also wins. But Carlson, with his last move, plays a very nice swindling tactic. He plays, he gives his opponent a choice, and he makes it sound like queen g5 is a very unpleasant threat, and you have to stop it. And so there's really two ways to do that, rook e7 and knight e7. And one of them wins, one of them doesn't. So what happens after rook to e7? Yes. Yeah, Gr Gregory Thomas, yes, 93. And he says 93. And this move, the point is, well, now this knight is being deflected. And you can't actually do anything about that because, well, if you do, if, if you play like rook f7, there's queen g5 check and white picks up the knight and then he draws. Or does he win? He no. I'm pretty sure this position is a draw after king, queen takes c3, queen h5 with a perpetual. So now the position is 0, 0.00, but black probably still wants to play for a win, so he plays king to g6. And the problem with this move is that. Well, it, it's okay. I mean, it. I'm pretty sure it, it doesn't lose necessarily, but well, Black's Black's plan to keep playing was wrong. Yeah, he plays knight takes a five, king takes queen takes c three. Okay, and now Black makes a decisive mistake here. He plays, he plays after Magnus's king h2, he plays queen to b2. And this move is a decisive error. So now white up a knight is 
seemingly getting promoted on, and he's also being threatened with mate. But White's also winning, so can you try and see how Magnus won this game? Yeah, so yeah, Melly, yes, h4, and so White's king escapes, it runs away, and so black takes on f2, and so the point is, yes, eventually white will play queen d7, and black will be mated, so the game continues, queen d7, white doesn't even care about promotion, because, well, black's about to get mated, and after Queen to e4 check, king g5, the checks run out after g4, and black resigns or gets mated. So, does anybody have any questions about this example? Okay, nobody? Okay. All right, let's move on to the next one. Okay, so this one's an interesting one, I think. So having got down, gone down the absolute extreme of swindling, we're now looking at a different defensive technique, um, which is, well, you might be able to see by the title, the concept of doing nothing, like absolutely nothing. Oops. So, in this position, you can probably see that white is much worse. He's down a pawn. And what's more, black pieces are all better placed. And so um, Lasker, who is white here, he frequently got into these types of positions. And then he draws or wins them because he really has this idea of how to play these bad positions really well. So in this position, Lasker plays an interesting move. Maybe not the best move objectively, but very interesting. So, can anybody try and see what he played? Okay, so, okay, king b1, okay. So Benjamin Lin says king b1. So you're on the right track. Um, yeah, king b1 is logical. 
And uh, actually, Basker plays something similar. He plays a3. And so, pretty much, I think his reasoning behind this move is that, well, my position's already really bad. I don't want to make it worse. So I need to see what is my opponent going to do. What is he going to do that is going to, well, improve his position enough to make me win? And I myself, when I'm in a better position and my opponent takes this mindset, it's very frustrating because what happens is, well, you know you're winning, but you need some winning plan and you don't see it. That's the problem. And very often you can like overpress and you can just forget that your opponent has some way to draw or even win. So if you don't see a direct way to get good counterplay or you don't see a way to improve your position, don't do anything that will, well, de degrade your position. Um, you do want to make sure that your position stays the same. I mean, it doesn't get worse. So pretty much what Lasker is going to do is he's going to do nothing. And from that point, so in this position after a3, sorry, after a3, Ninzovich plays a6. So he also sees no need to hurry. Um, and after bishop e3, rook d8, king a2, rook h8, king a1, rook d8, king a2. And you see, both players are doing nothing. But of course, black is better, so he needs to do something. So he plays rook e8. And this move already forms a plan. And so my question here is, what's black going to do? And so what would you do to try and attempt to make your position better or, well, like short circuit his plan? So what would you do? Bishop G5. Yes, so the plan is F6 and E5, but I'm not really sure. So Melly says Bishop G5, but do you mean this for white? Because if so, yeah, I mean, I guess black can play off six anyway, right? Yeah, I'm asking for black. So, f6, e5 is going to be black plan. If black does play e5 immediately, well, you're going to break up your pawn structure, and you don't really want that. Black has a nice solid pawn chain. And so, in this position, rook g8. And this might not even be the best move, because objectively, it is, of course, breaking a principle, which is don't trade when down material. But at the same time, it does change the character of the game somewhat. Um, like, let's say, black takes, takes, and rook d8, which was played in the game. Now white gets his rook a little bit more active, rook g7. And now f7 is under attack. And here's where things get really complicated. 
Um, surprisingly, it's not at all easy for Black to make progress here. So does anybody have any ideas? Because this is starting to get kind of complicated. I'll flip the board um, so you know it's black to work. Okay, so we have two responses. Uh, actually, three. So, F6. Okay, first of all, this move. It's actually completely fine. I didn't analyze it because I don't... I don't know. It's, it's a very flexible move, and I don't think it really deserves any analysis. The main point of this move is simply that black just gets the pawn out of the way and then e5 might come at a later point. e5 might come at a later point and then, and then we'll see from there. Okay, queen h3 to h8. Okay, suggested by Gregory Thomas. So this move, I guess the point is that after rook takes o7, there is queen to g8, but it's questionable to a certain degree, like even maybe an exchange stack. I have some compensation. I agree it certainly makes some sense, but I think the most logical move in this position is going to be queen h5, which is his second suggestion. And so the point is, the queen is kind of dual purpose here. Well, for one, it defends f7. Second idea is it kind of x-rays e2. And this can become important in some lines. So, but you can see even here, it's far from simple. Um, for example, White plays queen to g2 with the idea that he is going to just sidestep the pin and double on the g file. And now black plays bishop d6. Mm. 
I I kind of want to say this analysis is not 100% accurate. For example, bishop d6 is not the best move in the position, f4 is. But with this move, this type of move, when you're the defender, is kind of what you want, okay? Because you want, this pawn might become weak somehow. And let's say after something like bishop c1, I mean, it's not like black still has some forced win. He doesn't. And while the computer might like this move, I think a lot of people would try to avoid this type of move for as long as possible just because they don't want to get things out of control. So bishop d6, I think, is a move that a lot of people play. Bishop f8 to try and chase away the rook. And c4. So now I think this is logical. So the main point here is you waited for a very long time and your pieces are kind of more active than they were on move one, of course. Um, they were far less active on move one. Uh, if you wanna see for yourself, as you can see here, white's pieces are as nearly as active as in this position. And so I think this is really when you should start your action. When you seem to be at your peak of your activity and you're not going to really get improve your position by much. And so here, this is far from simple. Let me just give you a sample line. If black plays bishop to f8, rook g8. And in this position, it's already not so easy because, um, for one, white's very active. Um, his rook on g8 is very strong. And the d5 break might come at some point, fracturing black's pawn structure, and then the knight might even come to d4. So, a sample line is knight to f6 to drive out the rook. Rook g3. Uh, rook g5, queen h7 is similar, but now white black has an additional idea of bishop h6, so maybe rook g3 is more accurate. Bishop d6, rook g5, queen h8, and h, and what's really white going, what's black going to do? Um, it's not that easy to make progress, so trading rooks. Makes sense. Now d5. And now white has clear counterplay. For example, rook takes g5, knight takes g5, queen e8, d takes e6, b takes e6, queen to c2. And objectively, white's position really hasn't improved from the first diagram, actually. but. I think practically it has, because what you'll notice here is that black's pawns are already fractured and black's king is weak. And while white does now have to deal with connected passes, you really need counterplay. And I think this is what's really important. And I just think that how it's so amazing that just by playing these natural moves and well, doing nothing, you can just improve your position. It's I think it's very surprising. So in the game, Nimzovich plays rook f8. I don't really like this move, okay? It, it, it's fine, but it's kind of passive. And I think if you are, are going to be up a pawn, I don't think you should go into passivity. It's one of the worst ways to convert extra material. And here, Lasker plays c4. And so here, Lasker already has introduced some d5 ideas. And once again, Nimzovich has to be careful. So he plays knight to f6. But this move's already an error. I think, I think the intent is pretty simple. He wants to control d5 one more time. But it sadly doesn't work. So does anybody have any ideas here how white can play?
Um, so, okay, so one person suggested a knight to g5. Certainly has some logic, of course. Um, definitely you're hitting f7, but one problem is you're kind of placing your pieces a little bit awkwardly, so let me just see, is there any way I can exploit that? Well, for one, I can always take on h2. Um, I don't know how good this ending is, but I am up a pawn, so it seems pretty promising as far as I can see. Maybe I can even play after something like knight to g5. Maybe even... Hmm. Yeah, I agree. This does have some logic, but maybe queen takes h2 is a good ending. And anyway, white has, uh, well, that's a good attempt. White has a better try to play here. Um, so does anybody else see something? Yes, bishop g5, suggested by Benjamin. Um, yes, that's the point. And Nemozovich blundered. Um, because now if this knight moves, well, the bishop comes to e7. And so, just like that, most of black's advantage has already disappeared. Like, computer rival goes from, like, plus 2 for black to, like, 0. 0.9 or something. So it's not already so serious. And Nimzovich already makes a decisive mistake. Well, not decisive mistake, but decisive mistake in terms that black can no longer win after knight h5. So black already had to go back with knight e4, but after bishop e7, rook takes f7, it's far from clear. If anybody wants to see this analysis, um, I can send you the file. Um, I'm not sure how, but maybe I can send you the file. But in any case, it's quite complicated already here. And so, black plays knight h5. And like I said, black can't win anymore after this move. So, does anybody see what white plays? Okay, so somebody has suggested a knight g1. 
um, I believe if I take on H2, that works for me. So I don't think knight g1 is the right move. So yeah, somebody has suggested an interesting idea. Um, rook takes f7, takes rook d7. Very interesting. So Melly has suggested this, and he has provided with some us for some analysis. Um, Bishop d8, knight d5, and rook takes d4. So yeah, I do not think this works, but I wonder maybe you can consider flipping the move order with knight e5 first. So does this work? And now the point is that after bishop takes e5, queen e check, this is perpetual. Because if black goes to b6, White has queen c5, and this is a repetition. Black goes to c8, queen to e8. And if rook d6, c5 even wins for white. So that would be disastrous. So yeah, that is pretty much how last year, from a seemingly completely lost position, literally didn't do anything too special, and yet his opponent just couldn't win. and. It, it, this is much harder than it looks because you have to know when you're going to aim for counterplay and when you're not going to do anything. When, like, judge when is like the right time to start some action and try and provoke your opponent's mistakes. All right, so does anybody have any questions about this example? No? Okay, so let's go on to the next example. So I am going to stop sharing for one second. And this is, this may be, okay. This is probably the most complicated example um, we're going to see so far. So, So, okay, just wait a second. I need to share my screen. Um, a bit of technical difficulties. Uh, okay. All right, so this is going to be maybe our last example. Okay, so let's start. Okay, so the game starts with d4. Um, for those of you wondering which this game is, this game is Fisher versus, um, sorry, Ryshevsky was white and he was playing against Fisher. So, so we're going to be looking at this mostly from the black side, but it's a very complicated fight. So we might have some situations where we look at it from white side. So knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3. So we're in a queen's gambit. Takes and knight takes. Actually, this is a viable line. 
um, I think the main line goes e4, takes, takes, and c5. And it's sort of like a Grunfeld, but not really, because black has played e6 instead of g6. And so I feel like this might help white a little bit, but it's still completely playable. Knight f3, c5, e3. And so, knight c6, bishop d3, bishop b7, castles, castles, c takes on d4. So, white's last move, a3, is just a really useful move. Um, the main point is that at, in some lines, white's going to create a battery with bishop c2 and queen d3. And there will be no more knight before, which will fork the queen and the bishop. And then, well, white's powerful bishop will be gone. So, fissure takes on d4, takes, and knight f6. Nowadays, this line is considered a little bit dangerous for black, simply because He's breaking a principle, you know, he's moving the knight twice with for no real reason. Um, bishop f6 is considered to be more accurate with the idea that you're immediately pressuring d4 and you're not wasting any tempos whatsoever. This move used to be quite common though. Um, the main idea is the knight retreats, ending any knight takes d5 ideas, and then what black will feed in kind of is bishop with b6 and bishop b7. So, Roshevsky plays bishop to c2, using the aforementioned idea, he's going to create a battery. And now, Fischer plays b6. Bishop b7 is going to come, queen d3. And I feel like, at this point, it's all very logical. And, now, rook e1. So, in the game, Roshevsky plays bishop g5. It's kind of interesting to note that rook e1 is a very interesting idea. The main point is that you're kind of asking black, what are you going to do? It's not obvious. Um, and if black does play g6, which is the most popular move, white has bishop h6. When the bishop arguably stands better on h6 than it does on g5. So it's an interesting idea. It might not be an improvement, but it's certainly interesting. So in the game, this happens. Rook e8, h4. And so with this last move, h4, it's not really a start of anything. It's not the start of an attack or anything like that. But it's more just a useful pass. So pretty much the point is that, once again, you're asking Black, what's he going to do? Because this move h4 is going to come very useful in many lines. h5 might be possible, and the bishop is supported on g5. So Fischer plays rook c8, and rook a to c1. I'm of the opinion that rook a to d1 is slightly more accurate, just because, in my opinion, it makes more sense to put the rook on d1, because it does support the d5 break. But I don't think rook a c1 is, like, any weaker. It's just, it's my preference. And now, knight to e4. So, at this point, Roshevsky had an interesting alternative, which is queen knight takes d5, queen takes d5, bishop b3. This leads to very complicated play. Um, so, black plays queen d7. And with white's last moves, he has cleared the way for a d5 combo. d5 immediately is very interesting. And the main point is that if knight takes g5 here, well, knight e5 is a nice move. So rook takes e5, there's rook takes c1. So white takes with the h pawn. And now black takes on d5. It, it's not forced, but 
passing with like something like rook d8 is pretty inadvisable because I think your rook stands better on e8 than on d8, first of all. And second of all, you are losing a tempo. So if something like rook e8, maybe like rook cd1 to avoid the rook trade, and after takes, takes, white has some pressure. It looks very dangerous for black. So, but black actually, if he plays accurately, he can neutralize this initiative. Takes, takes, takes 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 knight to d8 a very nice move forcing some simplification and black equalizes so the direct play may not be best so Ryshevsky goes for a very interesting 94. now fisher plays a very interesting move but i'm not sure if it was correct but does anybody have any thoughts on what black should do here? Okay, so h6 is suggested. Um, well, I don't know. That looks a little bit dangerous to me because if you do decide to take on h4, takes, takes, and bishop g5, it seems like white has quite a strong attack. Um, knight f6 to try and trade pieces well um, yeah okay that's interesting but you do have to keep in mind that the knight actually just came from f6 so it does look a little bit strange to go back with knight f6 immediately <laughs> um nah, but Objectively, I'm also not so sure because mm, maybe white can play, let's say, mm, it's not so obvious, is it? Maybe white can play knight g3, and I would argue that his knight is better on g3, but it's also kind of, I mean, I don't see an immediate refutation. Um, so that seems somewhat, that seems pretty interesting. So F6. Um, F6, F6. Very logical. Okay, so f6 and here so here i'm actually not so sure because this is weakening um so let's say i play bishop h6 so fisher in the game actually played a similar move but i think f6 is just a worse version of it because i don't see how black is going to well use how he's benefiting from f6 because it 
because it seems like he's just blocking in his own bishop. Yes, f5. And I don't know, okay? This move is interesting, but it also leads to difficulties for block. And for this reason, I called it dubious. I don't know if it's, the computer doesn't seem to like it. I don't like it that much either, but it's very interesting and it's complicated. It What happens after this is complicated enough to the point where nobody knows. I don't know what's going on. Um, knight g3, okay, so now knight c3. Knight g3 is weaker because the knight has less, well, less plans to play here. For example, if boy takes, the knight stands weaker here. Um, it's just simply less flexible than on c3. For, because, for example, if it was on g3, not only is it not pressuring the knight here, it's also kind of stuck here. The only advantage I can see is it prepares h5, but as you can see, h5 is not generally a big problem for black. Um, you can generally just let white take, and then unless white has some direct way to get at black's king, black will be fine. So, knight c3. And so, now things are about to get really complicated. Um, so I will show you some of the beautiful lines that come from this. So bishop takes g5, and now knight takes g5, exclamation mark. Okay, h takes g5. Any ideas? What should black do here? Okay, so two suggestions, knight f4, and knight takes in three. Actually, two people are voting for knight to f4. Um, um, let me try something. I have never done this before, so. Um, let me try something. So there are quite a few interesting ideas. So how about we take a vote? Okay, so um, because I feel like objectively there's, this position is very complicated, so how about you write your move in the chat what you will play here? Everyone, if you can. So currently four people going for knight f4 and one person going for knight takes c3. Okay, I'll wait another 
20 seconds, I guess. Five for night of four. Okay, I think that's enough. So five people for night of four and one person for night take C3. All right, so night of four, very, very interesting move. But it's also very complicated. So if you want to play like this, you do have to calculate a lot. For example, after queen e3, does anybody have any suggestions? Knight g2 and knight d4, okay. Anyone else? Okay, knight g2, knight d4, if knight's taken. Okay. Fine. Actually, knight takes g2 doesn't work. Um, can anybody see why? Okay, so first of all, bishop d1 does not hold. Um, at least I do not think so. This looks disastrous for white, let's say. I'm not 100% sure, but like... I don't know, there's just so much pressure on this point. So maybe even like e5 or f4, very good. Grandmaster. Yes. Probably just, yeah. I think this just wins. Queen takes g5. Right. So, that being said, white has no reason to do that. Um, he has a much better move. Okay, so knight e4 is on the right track, but yes, bishop e4, suggested by Benjamin, just straight up wins. As you can see, white just going to win a piece in all lines. For example, bishop takes, takes, knight takes, knight f6. All right. So after knight to f4, black played another move. Oh, no. um, he played e5. Um, I think the idea should be relatively clear. So if d takes e5, which was played, knight takes g2, takes, and knight takes e5. And this is much stronger than before because bishop e4 has no logic because you can just take. However, white just, white didn't need to play like this, actually. I feel like he could have just checked on b3 and if king goes to f8, d5. And white's just much better. After like knight a5, bishop a2. How is black going to defend d5? So, in truth, this is all rather dubious for black, but it's still very interesting. So what happened after knight takes g2 takes, 
knight takes e5, bishop to a4. Once again, I'm pretty sure bishop d1 simply loses to um simply loses to f4. Maybe not actually this time. Um it's actually different because the knight's on e1. But I'm guessing like let's say even uh yeah, even knight takes even even like knight takes f three is interesting because so yes, it's not one hundred percent clear. I would probably just say black has close to winning attack after something like after something like king to g7. Just threaten knight takes f3, what's what going to do? So there's no more check on e8. I think this is just losing. So white plays bishop a4. Mm. The logic behind this is you're going to take on e8. Bishop takes f3, fails tactically too. Queen takes f3, rook takes and rook e8. So, black plays a brilliant move, rook c4. Very logical, bringing the rook into g4. Then white plays bishop. Oh, this isn't the game, by the way. This is um, this is just a line. Um, it's just analysis. So bishop b three. So white well, has a choice here. He actually can take this rook, or he can play bishop b three. So, really, which rook do you want to take? Pretty much, bishop takes on e eight draws after bishop takes f three, king f one, rook h four, knight e two knight g4, queen b3, and this is a forced draw, so all very complicated, and this is just equal. But in the game, black, white went for the other rook with the bishop b3, king g7. Very nice move. Like I said earlier, the king gets out of the way, so now knight takes f3 is a very serious threat. Bishop c4, knight f3, rook d1, forced. Queen e8, then knight e1, wins the queen, everything. So, black has, white has to counterattack the queen, knight d4 check. And after bishop g2 check, this ends in a draw, which is, I, I think this is just very fascinating, but it's also very complicated, and this position is equal. So let's get back to the game. Or after f5, knight c3, white takes with the knight. And now Fisher reveals what he was going for, knight f4. But objectively, this does not favor him. And there. I mean, this is very dangerous, as you can see, because black is going entirely for tactics on g2. Otherwise, he's just going to be positionally lost. His other idea, of course, is to take on d4. So now white has two queen moves, really, queen e3 and queen f3. In the game, queen e3 was played. And this worked out well for white, but black could have white could have played, black could have played more accurately. So, the right move is queen f3. And the idea behind this, I think, is pretty simple. It does look rather counterintuitive that white would put his bishop in the x, I mean, his queen in the x ray of the bishop. But really, it's not really an x ray, it's more a pin. The knight is pinned to the bishop. And it's all very unclear, and I did not analyze this. Um, so I, I did not have 
time to analyze this because I'm pretty sure it's something like queen c7 should be played and it's all very complicated. But I think white is better. So, queen e3 was played in the game and queen takes d4. So now does anybody have any ideas for white? Because black has won a pawn and so if you don't do something, you're going to be down a pawn in an ending and that will not be nice. Yes, okay. Melly has suggested knight b5. Very good. Um, but it goes a little bit deeper than that because, well, black actually has two options here. Queen takes b2 and queen takes c3. Queen takes c3 was played in the game, which is probably correct. Um, queen takes b2 is very dangerous. Y has two options here. You can fork, which is probably the most logical move, but he also has queen takes f4, which is the best move, apparently. So knight d6 leads to some very complicated lines, and I won't discuss them, but queen takes f4 just gives white a very strong attack on the king. You can see black's pieces have completely abandoned the poor king here, and white now has queen and knight in the in, close to the king, so it's going to be a very strong attack. Queen takes b5, and now h5 is strongest. Knight takes e6 can be met by queen d5, which is less clear because you let your his queen get back into the defense. So h5. And now, well, I, well, white is going to take, and he's going to take, and then he's going to play queen h4, and then he's going to check on h7, and then he's going to mate black. So it doesn't look very good. So black plays queen d5, white takes on g6, and a question after h takes g6, which is better, queen h2 or queen h4? Okay, we got one person for queen h4. Two. Three. Does anybody else want to vote? One person for Bishop before. 
that was not an option, but I'll take it. Okay, so which move is better? Well, I guess to explain this logically, what what other purpose do box move queen d5 have? Well, yes, it did bring black's queen back into the defense of the king. But actually, you'll also notice it's very close to checkmate. If this knight is out, this is checkmate. So, actually, queen h2 is better. And the reason is prophylaxis. Um, it, g2 is defended, so... In no lines is g2 going to be under attack with some discovery. So the thing is, after queen to h4, after rook e7, black has knight e5 in many lines. And this gains a crucial tempo by hitting g2. For example, if white plays rook takes e6, which at first seems to win on the spot, black has this really good move bit knight to e5. And now, as you can see, g6 is defended by the knight, and suddenly, oh no, it's going to be made in one. As you can see, if the queen was on h2, none of this would have happened. After knight e5, white takes a rook, says good game, black resigns, the game's over. So that is why queen h2 is the better move. Okay. Okay, now let's go back to the game. Queen takes c3, f takes c3. And clearly Fisher had some idea when coming here. If if he had like if he had no idea, then he would get forked on d6 and then the game would be over. But but black has something here. What move should black play? All right, somebody suggests knight takes g2. Good. So, point is, g2 pawn is being x-rayed by this bishop on b7. So, if white takes on g2, which happened in the game, he's opening himself for a bunch of discovered checks. Okay, a continuation. Where where should black go? Where should black play here now? Okay, knight d four check. Knight d four. Okay. So. Okay. Knight d4 was played in the game. It's not the best move. Um, Fisher should have played knight b4. And it has pretty much the same idea, but with an added bonus. After white plays bishop e4, which is by far the best response, the point of the move bishop e4 is you're blocking the check, and now the knight's under attack. So if Black were to, let's say, play bishop takes e4 check, takes, takes. At first, you're up two pawns, but now you're down a piece. So, 
So black play has this nice move of knight t3. And this knight is immune because the pin. If white, this move is legal because black would then take the king. So white takes on b7. Black takes on c1. Takes, takes. And now white grabs a pawn with knight takes on e6. So, in the end, white does end up with a better position here. If rook takes e6, then bishop d5, king f7, and now not bishop takes e6 check, but knight d4, and black cannot add another defender to the pin, so he loses the whole rook. So, black has to play something like rook e7, bishop d5, and after rook d7, the position is definitely better for white, but it's also not so clear because, yes, two minor pieces are usually stronger than a rook, but it's an ending already, and black has a pawn. So white is better, but black has good drawing chances, and this is what Fisher should have went for. Because after knight d4 check, bishop to e4, well, now black has no more forks, so to avoid losing a piece, he has to play bishop takes e4, takes and take on b5. While black's temporarily up two pawns here, knight f6 check, forks the king and the rook, and white, end up, white ends up up in exchange. Game continues, king to f7, knight e takes e8, rook takes e8. Okay. And now, Roy plays a really nice move here. Try and see what that is. Yeah. Yes, A4 as suggested by Benjamin. So the idea is that, well, the point is that the knight has to move. It only has one place that's not protected. And now white's rook penetrates with rook c7 check. So black is in a bit of trouble now. Um, he's down in exchange. And yes, he does have two pawns, which is normally a material equivalent, but the problem here is white has control of the open file, and also it's difficult for black to defend all his pawns. So, what should black play here? Go back to when knight takes rook. Oh, okay. So somebody asked me to go back here. So yeah, rook takes c1 is inferior, and king takes e8 hangs a rook. So rook takes, rook is forced. The reason why this move is bad is after rook c1, this type of endgame is usually lost for black because white's rook simply dominates the knight and it has access to the only open file. For example, let's say black white plays a4 and compared to the game what black has no rook to help him create counterplay and black's pawns just all fall and then black loses so it's very it was necessary for black to concede control of the open file with rook takes e8 if that clears things up so after rook c7 check what would you play here as black because you know you're worse, well, almost losing, but you also need to create practical chances. OK. 
Okay, one person for rook e7, one person for king f6. So which move is better? Because I think these are the two main choices, king f6 and rook e7. So does anybody else have an opinion? Preserve the rook, okay. Does anybody else have an idea? So who else has an opinion? Okay, nobody, so let's, okay, let's keep going. So yes, um, king f6 is the best move. The reason for this is, while rook e7 might look better at first, because it seems to keep, I mean, both of black's pawns alive, while king f6 not only hangs the h pawn, it also hangs the a pawn. The problem is, after this accurate move, rook to c1, Black is in trouble because his rook is pinned to his king, so he cannot avoid the rook trade. And let's say he takes, takes, takes. This is just much worse than the game because he has no counterplay with his rook. So he's just losing. And so he would be forced to therefore play knight e8, so that after rook takes e7, king takes e7. At least the knight on e8 defends c7, so you can't come in and win a pawn, at least. But the problem is white can just go the long way. He can just go rook c8, and then he's going to go rook a8 and take the pawn. And there's absolutely nothing that can do about it. For example, if a8, and so now has well if black plays a5 rook b8 forces the win of the b6 pawn because king c6 or king c7 hangs the knight so if and if black tries this clever trick with knight c7 trying to trap the rook i'm sorry but i'm going to escape before you manage to do that so therefore it is essential for black to keep counter chances with king 2f6 and so now white plays a very nice and very accurate move, rook c1. The problem with taking either pawn is after rook c8, well, first of all, black is immediately threatening to penetrate, and white doesn't really want that to happen. So after rook e2. But now rook c4 comes. And this is very unpleasant, because the rook is eyeing both pawns. And because the rook is so active on c4, I think black has very good chances to draw this now. So what white needs to do is he needs to make sure he keeps control of the open file, because open files are where rooks are like the best. So to use his material advantage, he does want to keep the open file and prevent black from getting control of it. So rook c1 is a very nice move. Black plays h6. So the idea of this move, I think, is, well, Black going to play g5, and he's going to create counterplay. He's going to create a pass g pawn. But actually, according to computer, the computer really hates this move. And I can't understand why, because to me, it looks like the best way to try and play for a draw. But the computer insists that a5 is the best move. And after rook c6, knight e4, rook b takes b6, and rook d8, apparently black is better off. And that may be true, actually, but it doesn't seem very different to me, at least. So after h6, white takes on a7, black plays knight e4. So the reason he plays this move is 
one, he activates the knight and puts it on a very nice square on e4, where it pretty much controls the whole board. It controls f2, g3, d2, and c5, and all of which are pretty important squares. And now, white plays rook a6. He's going to take another pawn. And here, black has to play rook d8. Um, there's simply no other move at this point. If rook 2 b8, rook c6 is just hopeless for him because, well, first of all, you're not going to be able to defend b6 anyway, as you can see. There's no way to defend it. And if b5, then I take on e6. So black has to play actively. He has to forget everything about his queen side to create some counterplay with rook d8. It's very important. When you're in these types of positions that are close to losing, you don't go into passivity. That is very bad. Um, the problem with that is that you're really going to have no chance because, well, white is the reason he's better is because a rook is better than a knight. So if you try and defend passively, the rook will just simply be better than the knight and then, well, then white will just win. For example, if like here, for example, if the knight was a rook, then black would like play like rook b4. But like, it's not that type of piece, and for that reason, passive defense is hopeless. So black plays rook d8. Nice. He's threatening to penetrate on d2. So now a small question: If you were white here, what would you do? Okay, one for rook to c6. Any other ideas? Because, I mean, it's a very complicated position still. Rook c2. Okay, logical. Anyone else have any ideas? All right, okay. Okay, I'll just stop it from here. I'm kind of surprised nobody mentioned rook takes b6. In my opinion, that is, I mean, one of the most logical moves, right? You kind of went to b6 to take on b6. You went to a6 to take on b6, right? So yes, it's true. This does look kind of dangerous, but it looks dangerous and actually is dangerous are two different things. And if white played properly here with king g1, he could have successfully um, repelled black's counterplay. But this is not so easy to say. I mean, it's not so easy to do in practice. Um, of course, if you have a bad position and then your opponent plays well, you're still going to have a bad position. It's like it's not going to change. But the point of this lecture is to show how you can try and make your opponent make mistakes so that you can escape. So, as you can see, it's already not so easy for white to find the right winning plan because black has a lot of counterplay. And for example, white black plays g5, white plays rook c6, attacking e6. Um, this is arguably more accurate than h6 g5, which I didn't analyze simply because this wins oh, about when this ends, probably in like 10 minutes or so, I would say. Um, simply, um, simply because after g takes h4, rook takes e6, king g5, rook g6 check, king h5. Here Fisher only gets rook takes h6 when the black king manages to get into f3, which looks very dangerous, of course. 
So I feel like instead of that, why should just play a5? And well, Black's kick is stalemated on h5, and g3 is under control, so let's say h3. I don't know. For example, here I might already play something like this. It seems very good for white in any case. So, so in the game though, Ryshevsky plays rook c2, but there was no need to, um, as you can see. Now Fisher plays rook d3. Once again, he's trying to get more pawns so that his counterplay comes faster. The computer is really like doesn't like this and says that rook d6 should draw. And that's probably true, but I mean, it's not always so easy to go into passivity. I mean, like I said, passive defense usually doesn't work. I think the only reason it works in this position is just due to the awkward position of white's rook on a6. It's kind of trapped. And so white has difficulty making progress. For example, if b4, I'm guessing black can play g5. But like it's it's still not very clear. Like I'm I'm not really sure. I, I think Fisher's choice seems to make much more sense to me. Rook takes b6, rook takes e3, and now you can see f4, f3 is coming. So a5, f4. And rook f2, blunder. But uh, one, he wasn't time pressure, I'm pretty sure, Ryshevsky. And it's a logical move. Uh, White gives up material, and he says, you're not going to be able to stop my A-pawn. But Black can. Um, black can stop black, White's A-pawn, which means that Black will then be the one playing for a win. White only had one way to play for a win now, which is this incredible move, Rook to B4. The point is, after F3 check, King F1, King f5, instead of giving up um, white's rook passively, like Ryshevsky did in game, white chooses when he is going to give up the rook. Because black's knight is too powerful to deal with forever, but you can choose that ideal moment to give up the rook. And as you can see, as soon as black's threats start to get dangerous, white just gives it back and he queens. So b5, b6, b7 is going to come and white wins. But this is very difficult to see in my opinion and Fisher really did a nice job making it as hard as he can for Ryshevsky to find the proper ways to win. So rook f2 was played and so how does black stop the a-pawn? It's actually a decent question because it's not so simple. I'll flip it for you. Any ideas for how to stop the A-pawn? Um, okay, so rook d3. Okay, since we're running out of time, I'll just say this move, uh, I don't think um, it makes too much sense. Because um, after a6, rook d8, a7, rook a8, rook a6, white pushes the b-pawn up the board and black resigns. So yes, rook e5 is the only way. Black has to get his rook behind the pawns, not in front. Otherwise, he won't be able to stop them at all. b4, rook e3. So now a3 is available. So this brilliant maneuver allows black to get his rook behind 
And now Black is playing for a win with his three connectors. Rook c6, a fatal blunder. Um, why well, had to play rook b8 here? And the basic drawing idea is White's going to play b6, he's going to check on f8, and he's going to play b7, and he'll be queening. So after g4, b6, well, rook f8 check first, king e5, then b6. Black is, well, white is forcefully queening his pawn. Luckily, black can still take a perpetual, and the game should end in a draw after rook a2, rook a1. So, this was the proper way to defend. However, Ryshevsky was probably kind of surprised that he was no longer winning, and so he plays rook c6. Probably with the same idea with rook c8, but it's already a fatal blunder. And after g4, rook c8, king f5, b6, g3 check, black is one tempo faster, which is enough to win the game. And after rook f8 check, king d4, rook takes f4 check, king takes f4, b7, g1, queen. King d4 was easier, queen, rook a2, and then mate. But Fischer's move wins too. And after a bunch of checks, Fischer eventually finds how to escape them. And since now the b6 is under control of the queen, White resigned. So that's the end of this game, and that's the end of this lecture. So, does anybody have any questions? Any questions at all? No? Okay, so thank you for everybody for attending.